um, and Chris Jackson, they looked at this um, coronary allograft vasculopathy, so CAV, um, basically a, a post-heart transplant deterioration of the arterial walls. So they have this panel data um, so of 614 individuals um, and, and repeated measures for different um, um, for over, over time for roughly each year. Um, and there are four health states in this model, so state one to state four. Um, so state one, everyone starts with no CAV, and this model is looking at how they progress to having mild or moderate CAV, severe CAV, or, or death. Um, so I thought I would maybe just, rather than talk too much, I'll just take you through what I've done. Um, I appreciate there's a different link. This is, this is my own link. Um, and of course, there's some references that you can read up through the actual MSM package itself. Um, so maybe if I, can I, there's the MSM package there. Um, my screen sharing is paused. Screen share. Oh, okay. I need to come out and back in again. Okay. Uh, let me yes. just share my uh, screen. Um, okay, so I appreciate I've done this using the R uh, package MSM pre-built uh, data set and functions. So apologies in advance for the really hacky code, um, but I suppose it's just to give you a flavor of, of, of what I'm kind of trying to touch upon here. So, um, so we, uh, I mean, we look at MSM, um, uh, with all those manuals, sorry, I'm just going to move some stuff about here. Um, so essentially this data set um, uh, consists of the patient numbers. So we have this individual uh, has seven records um, and the age that they are um, at each, at each, um, rec for each record, the years. So basically you could start their first record at zero and t start the time point there. Age of diagnosis, um, their sex, uh, their primary diagnosis, and the cumulative number of rejections that they've had, and then the state, which I talked about in the slides. So state one has no CAV and state four is death. Um, and that's our, our data set that we're working through. Um, and so you can do nice things in MSM. This is all just in the example. So for example, you can see in this portion of data, you actually have that these are the movements um, that, that are shown. So we can see that, um, yeah nobody really moves from anywhere from death. So that's kind of good to know to check in your, in your data. Um, so to kind of kickstart an MSM model, like I said, we need these kind of initial Q metrics. So MSM has an inbuilt function of uh, Q crude. Um, they just look at the number of movements from health state, out of the health state to a different health state um, over time. Um, and then we actually run the model here. So this is, this is kind of a generic um, code that we would use. So essentially you have MSM and they have the state, uh, the health state, uh, years would be the time variable. So you'd have years, or I could have used um, their age, um, something that is telling us um, what time we're at. So the subject is their patient number, the data we're using is CAV data, um, and the Q matrix I've just used as this initial Q matrix. I could have used Q crude. Um, and then the death state was our, our health state four. So if I run this, um, it should go quite quickly. Um, and what we're doing, what we're seeing from the output is essentially these um, transition intensities. And we uh, can see the minus two log likelihood value. Um, so we can um, take from that what you will, but actually what I wanna show is actually when we look at covariates in the model. So if we add sex into this model, um, so I just add here covariates um, and sex. So when we see that, uh, if I just look at the results there, it actually gives us a hazard ratio for this covariate. So for example, if I take uh, the movement from health state one to health state two, so that's uh, CAV free to mild CAV, um, I think one is female and zero is male. So if you're female, you're kind of, less likely, half as likely than a male to move from health state one to two, which is good news for me. Um, but yeah, we kind of want to add in multiple covariates. So one of the ways that we can do this is actually adding um, the 
the previous uh, adding Kubernetes one at a time and using the previous key matrix um, to, to use that as our initial start. So for example, if I have just our, our model with no covariates, um, we just use that original key matrix. Um, and I just added this line in because I like to watch things to see how they're, they're going. Um, and then use this key matrix uh, from this model to actually then input this in our next model where we have uh, the covariate sex. And if we build up the model that way and add it kind of one by one, um, I've done this in the past with maybe 10, 10 covariates. Um, you can do things like the minus two log likelihood, your likelihood ratio tests for whatever reason that you're putting your covariates in the model. Um, and essentially you can, you can build up um, to this. What I've done here is a three covariates in the model. Um, so I've just added sex, uh, the cumulative number of rejections and the diagnosis age. Um, but I actually could have done this at once. Um, and these take a little while to run. I've actually pre-run this one, let me just check. So our model is just when we've added these all, um, kind of thrown them all in at once. And then model three is where we actually added it one by one. Um, and so if we see the differences, um, so let me just zoom out slightly. Um, so we can see the differences um, in the transition intensities. I mean, they're not too different. So for example, minus 0 0.17030 minus 0 0.17006. Um, confidence intervals might be a little bit different. So for example, here you can see a huge confidence interval from zero to about four, three, six, from health state two to four for the covariate sex. Um, here we have zero to about 80. Um, so there are, there are subtle differences. And I suppose I've, I've looked at um, kind of what helps the algorithm converge quicker, um, which um, tends to be using uh, one adding the, this approach where you add one, the key matrix um, from the model with uh, a covariate added um, and add that up iter iteratively. Um, so you can do that, um, but essentially what we want to do is look at the probabilities. So um, again, in MSM we have probability functions. So over 10 years, what's the probability? Um, we could actually use the piecewise modeling um, in MSM. So I've used an example here of the cumulative number of rejections where that Q matrix might actually change within the time interval, but actually that's a pretty bad example. What would be a good example is if I had some data to say that actually the treatment changes or there's something that changes to define that, um, just to that change to show um, what happens. So we can look at that piecewise modeling um, and then we could also take um, confidence intervals and we'll get some nice, um, using the normal distribution there. Um, and we can do bootstrapping, I'll not run that because that can take a while. Um, but actually, um, if I look at the probability for each person, um, if I, sorry, if I run this really terrible coding, but uh, essentially the model can give us this uh, baseline Q matrix. Um, and I've just, I've just translated that into Q base um, because MSM gives us like state one to state four, but it just, makes things a little bit annoying when I actually want to use that output because um, I just want those, those the numerical values. So um, if we look back at the model where we had the QRS, um, those, that Q matrix made up of all the individual intensities, um, we actually would then have the Q base uh, multiplied by the exponential of the other Q matrices for all the covariates. Um, so this is where I take the exponential of, we're looking at sex, cumulative number of rejections and the diagnosis age. Um, so basically we have this, this equation. Um, and so we're actually looking um, at the probability that we wanna uh, estimate for say each individual. Um, so uh, if I use the EXPM package, we have a probability just creating some empty space. Again, I could have used dimensions of our data here. Um, and what this is doing in this loop is looking at, okay, we'll calculate this, this key matrix, so the movement between each health state, um, but for each individual. So in the data we have, um, okay, so that this person's, if they're male or female, the number of rejections and the diagnosis age, um, but you could have a number of variables there. You could actually have quite a lot of covariates and in a key matrix, of course, the, the, the diagonals are the negative of the sum 
of all the others in the row. Um, and then the probability um, was just the exponential of the Q matrix. Um, and I'm going to look at the probability of movement just between health state one and health state two. So if I run that, um, we can actually see that if I look in my data, we have uh, the probability um, that this person uh, moves from health state one to health state two is 14%. Um, of course, that doesn't really make much sense uh, unless they're already in health state one. Um, and I can take those out in a minute. Um, and essentially the, the idea of doing this as an individual an individual way is that, um, so for example, the calves that we're looking at, you can actually flag up well, that, what's their probability of movement and they all have collars. So the farmers can go and say, actually, this calf is, is going to get sick. The probability is above a certain threshold. Um, so we can take that calf aside and then, you know, feed them and give them antibiotics, things like that. Um, and you can use the lower and upper confidence intervals of the Q matrix. So if I just do this again, using the lower confidence intervals, um, then we have, uh, just do it the same way. Um, and then we have a lower confidence interval, um, just to show you. We have 14%, um, but actually lower confidence interval is 11.5%. And then we could do it with the upper and each individual will have their individual probability. And if you want to actually use this in a cost effectiveness model, you could actually, um, you could actually average over the cohort, but actually you could look at simulating those initial start values, adding the variables one by one, um, and then actually kind of make this pretty big um, and then kind of collapse back down to, to taking over average over the cohort. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, for this example, it only makes sense whenever I look at everyone started in this health state one. Um, oh, did I run that? Um, so yeah, so we have just all the individuals here. Um, so they all start and that's their probabilities because obviously that only makes sense if it's sort of a primary prevention. Um, but we can look at all the different probabilities. And, and yeah, uh, I kind of just have flown through that, but maybe that's where I'll stop and yeah, see if there's any. Thank you. <laughs> Sure. Thank you. Um, that's very, very interesting. So there is indeed a question. Before I asked you the question, uh, I just wanted to make a very quick question, um, comment, which will um, sort of show my, my very Bayesian um, bias. And uh, that's to go back. Obviously, I know this isn't the point of your example, but when you had that huge confidence interval on the um, sort of the, the, the effect of sex, essentially, that seems to scream of some kind of problem with separation. So you might have in that observed data, in the observed data for that specific transition, only males or only females, or very, very few males or very, very few females. So essentially, the model cannot estimate reliably that kind of effect because you don't have enough variation. And yeah. if you use a Bayesian version of that model, you can restrict the prior so that it doesn't explode out to essentially infinity. So this 80.158 number is just our way of telling you, well, I don't really know what this is. And it could be anything between zero, zero and plus infinity because yeah. there's no information in the data to estimate that parameter. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, but I, I, obviously I know that wasn't the point of your, your example. Oh, yeah. 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 No, no, it, 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 yeah, no, it makes sense. And I think cause the, there will be problems with convergence in MSM if there are small numbers as well. So, um, you know, between in certain transitions. So there, there are different issues in this as well. Yeah. And then there was a com, uh, well, question slash comment. Uh, how does uncertainty approach for MSM compare with the standard errors for probabilities in M state, uh, which is a, a separate R package in terms of speed, et cetera? Yeah, I haven't used M state very much. Um, so I'm not too sure. Um, but it is something that I will look into, I suppose, as I'm, I'm, I'm kind of playing about with this actually at the moment. Um, I'm trying to write this, this, mm -hmm. this up. Um, but yeah, I had looked at the, the confidence intervals. Um, I'd actually done some work actually just looking at individual transitions using kind of more like a, just a traditional approach, you know, looking at one transition individually. Um, and, and the, yeah, I mean, confidence intervals were narrower in, in the example that I used uh, in MSM. Um, but I don't know if that was just looking at the model as a whole, mm -hmm. looking at the likelihood rather than just the individual um, transitions. Well, but in terms of M state, I'm, I'm not too sure. Okay. Um, just to point out that uh, in the link, somebody has just forwarded the, uh, 
an external link, sorry, in the chat, somebody has forwarded an external link to a tutorial on MSM for cost effectiveness analysis. And uh, I've replied that actually we do have, I think, links to that same tutorial from the RHDA website, which is also, again, another point for me to be shamelessly um, kind of doing promotion for our own stuff. If anybody has case studies, tutorials of, um, you know, real examples of using R and uh, are happy to share, we absolutely uh, are very, very happy to uh, include links or even host that kind of tutorial in the R for HDA website. Um, I think when we originally set that, that out, one of the uh, ambitions was to make it kind of a repository of such things, of examples of where people have used our code and maybe are happy to share that code so that other people can use it as a template for their own analysis. So uh, do get in touch with us if you are uh, in that position and that would be absolutely our pleasure to, um, to host your case studies in the, in the RHDA website. All right, thank you again, Felicity. That was uh, very, very interesting. Um, I think what, we, uh, what we're doing now is take another quick break, maybe another uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we can maybe go back uh, at 11.20, let's just say, for the final um, discussion table. Perfect, so I'm resuming the recording. And uh, I will share again these slides uh, just for a few seconds. Um, so before I go on into this, I should apologize because um, this is the first time that we attempt like a panel discussion on a Zoom call. So I don't know what will happen. I trust the panelists that they all know how, what, they, what, what they're doing and most certainly they do know what they're talking about. So even if the technology fails us, I think it will be a very interesting uh, discussion anyway. So um, I'll, I'll briefly introduce the panelists, uh, Francois Magnien from NICE, uh, Venediktos um, Kapatanakis from uh, Evidera, uh, Liz Fenwick from uh, Farmrate, and Andy Biggs Briggs from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So I think all of the speakers are, are um, are super well known and super uh, big names. Uh, so that's a, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. And I think what we uh, envisaged in asking you to, to, to give a discussion for us is to, um, to, to give us a, your thought on what can be done to make R more acceptable and accessible. What can we do to actually move forward and just go to the next step? I think we've now got some momentum, uh, momentum behind us. When we started this, we didn't think that we'd be able to do in the space of just a couple of years, big workshops like today and Friday. Overall, I think it's been over 300 people who participated. And this is an awesome uh, success as far as we can see. The, the website is starting to be populated with more and more resources for people. But what more can we do? What, what more can we um, can we bring forward to regulators and other people to uh, to make this even more prevalent. Um, so I think what I'll do, I'll, I'll stop sharing uh, my screen and uh, I'll open up the discussion. Um, I think Howard was meant to um, sort of uh, introduce the panel, uh, but he couldn't be with us. So I'll try and fill in his, uh, his um, place, but also I'm very happy to leave the discussion to you guys and, uh, and uh, be like in the background and not say anything else for the rest of the of the time. So over to you. I think Andy, if you want to start perhaps. Ah, okay, that, that, that's fine. Um, I had prepared some uh, opening um, slides, if that's okay. Yes, sure. And um, uh, there are not very many of them, uh, but I do need to find them within Yes, okay. I think I know how this works. So can you see my slides? Yes. All right, I, d I don't have, I don't, uh, I don't have uh, very many. Uh, let me start though by introducing uh, myself just um, uh, and a little bit of my background. And I, f I feel a little of an interloper here as some of the people who know me will know that I'm not, uh, I'm not, I haven't used R very much. It does exist as a 
uh, something on my computer 